Well, hi there, and welcome to Storytime for Kids. I'm Mrs. McCurley, and today's story is part two of Aladdin and his magical lamp from the famous collection of stories, Arabian Nights. Oh, be sure to subscribe and hit the bell so you hear about all of our most recent videos. Let's get started. Aladdin and his magical lamp, part two. Once home, he said to the genie, Build me a palace of the finest marble set with jasper, agate, and other precious stones. In the middle, you shall build me a large dome. It's four walls of massy gold and silver, each having six windows, whose lattices, all except one, which is to be left unfinished, must be set with diamonds and rubies. There must be stables and horses and grooms and servants go and see about it. The palace was finished by the next day. And the genie showed him all of his orders faithfully carried out, even to the laying of a velvet carpet from Aladdin's palace to the Sultan's. Aladdin's mother then dressed herself carefully and walked to the palace with her servants. Well, he followed on horseback. The Sultan sent musicians with trumpets and cymbals to meet them, so that the air resounded with music and cheers. She was taken to the princess, who saluted her and treated her with great honor. At night, the princess said goodbye to her father and set out on the carpet for Aladdin's palace with his mother at her side and followed by the hundred servants. She was charmed at the sight of Aladdin, who ran to receive her. Princess, he said, blame your beauty for my boldness if I've displeased you. She told him that, having seen him, <laughs> she willingly obeyed her father in this matter. After the wedding had taken place, Aladdin led her to a huge hall where a feast was spread and she supped with him and they danced until midnight. The next day, Aladdin invited the Sultan to come see the palace. On entering the hall with the four and twenty windows, with their rubies, diamonds, and emeralds, the Sultan cried, oh, It's a world's wonder! There's only one thing that surprises me. Was it by accident that one window was left unfinished? <laughs> no, sir, by design, said Aladdin. I wished your majesty to have the glory of finishing the palace. The Sultan was pleased and sent for the best jewelers in the city. He showed them the unfinished window and bade him to fix it up just like the others. <clears throat> Sir, replied the spokesman, we cannot find jewels enough. And then the Sultan had his own fetched, which they soon used, but to no purpose. For in a month's time, the work was not half done. Aladdin, knowing that their task was in vain, bade them to undo their work and carry the jewels back. And the genie finished the window at his command. The Sultan was surprised to receive his jewels again and visited Aladdin, who showed him the window finished. The Sultan embraced him. The envious vizier, meanwhile, hinted that it was the work of enchantment. Aladdin had won the hearts of the people by his gentle bearing. He was made captain of the Sultan's armies and won several battles for him, but remained modest and courteous as before and lived thus in peace and content for several years. But far away in Africa, the magician remembered Aladdin and by his magic arts discovered that Aladdin instead of perishing miserably in the cave, had escaped and married a princess with whom he was living in great honor and wealth. He knew that the poor tailor's son could only have accomplished this by the means of the lamp and traveled by night and day till he reached the capital of China, bent on Aladdin's ruin. As he passed through the town, he heard people talking everywhere about a marvelous palace. <clears throat> Forgive my ignorance, he said. What is this palace you speak of? <laughs> Have you not heard of Prince Aladdin's palace? 
was the reply. The greatest wonder in the world? I will direct you if you've a mind to see it. The magician thanked him, who spoke, and having seen the palace, knew that it had been raised by the genie of the lamp. And he became half mad with rage. And luckily, Aladdin had gone a-hunting for eight days, which gave the magician plenty of time. Hmm. He bought a dozen copper lamps, put them in a basket, and went by the palace crying, New lamps for old! <laughs> Followed by a jeering crowd. The princess, sitting in the hall of four and twenty windows, sent a servant to find out what the noise was, who came back <laughs> laughing so that the princess scolded her. Madam, replied the servant, who can help laughing to see an old fool offering to exchange fine new lamps for old ones? Another servant, hearing this, said, Well, there's an old one on the cornice. There, which he can have. Now, this was the magic lamp, which Aladdin had left there, as he could not take it out hunting with him. The princess not knowing its value, laughingly bade the servant to take it and make the exchange. She went and said to the magician, hmm, give me a new lamp for this one. He snatched it and bade the servant take her choice amid the jeers of the crowd. Little he cared, but left off crying his lamps, 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 and went out of the city gates to a lonely place where he remained until nightfall, when he pulled out the lamp and rubbed it. The genie appeared, <clears throat> and at the magician's command, carried him, together with the palace and the princess in it, to a lonely place in Africa. <laughs> the next morning, the sultan looked out the window towards Aladdin's palace and rubbed his eyes. For it was gone. He sent for the vizier and asked what had become of the palace. The vizier looked out too and was lost in astonishment. He again put it down to enchantment. And this time, the sultan believed him and sent 30 men on horseback to fetch Aladdin in chains. They met him riding home, bound him, and forced him to go with them on foot. The people, however, who loved him, followed, armed, to see that he came to no harm. He was carried before the sultan, who ordered the executioner to cut off his head. The executioner made Aladdin kneel down, bandaged his eyes, and raised his shemitar to strike. At that instant, the vizier, who saw that the crowd had forced their way into the courtyard and they were scaling down the walls to rescue Aladdin, called to the executioner, stay, to stay his hand. The people indeed looked so threatening that the sultan gave way and ordered Aladdin to be unbound and pardoned him in the sight of the crowd. Aladdin now begged to know what he'd done. False wretch, said the sultan, come hither, and showed him from the window, the place where the palace had stood. Aladdin was so amazed, he couldn't say a word. Where is my palace and my daughter, demanded the sultan. For the first, I'm not so deeply concerned, but my daughter, I must have, and you must find her or lose your head. Aladdin begged for 40 days in which to find her, promising if he failed to return and suffer the death at the Sultan's pleasure. His prayer was granted, and he went forth sadly from the Sultan's presence. For three days, he wandered about like a madman, asking everyone what had become of his palace. But they only laughed and pitied him. He came to the banks of a river and knelt down to say his prayers before throwing himself in. But in so doing, he rubbed the magic ring that he still wore. And the genie he had seen in the cave 
appeared and asked his will. Save my life, genie, said Aladdin, and bring my palace back. That is not in my power, said the genie. I am only the slave of the ring. You must ask the slave of the lamp. Even so, said Aladdin, but thou can take me to the palace and set me down under my dear wife's window. He at once found himself in Africa under the window of the princess. Oh, it fell asleep out of sheer weariness. He was awakened by the singing of the birds and his heart was lighter. He saw plainly that all his misfortunes were owing to the loss of the lamp and vainly wondered who had robbed him of it. That morning, the princess rose earlier than she had done since she had been carried into Africa by the evil magician, whose company she was forced to endure once a day. She, however, hmm, treated him so harshly that he dared not live there altogether. And as she was dressing, one of her women looked up and saw Aladdin. The princess ran and opened the window, and at the noise she made, Aladdin looked up. <laughs> she called to him to come to her, and great was the joy of these lovers at seeing each other again. After he'd kissed her, <laughs> Aladdin said, I beg of you, princess, in God's name, before we speak of anything else, for your own sake and mine, tell me what has become of an old lamp that I left on the cornice in the hall of four and twenty windows when I went to hunting. Alas, she said, I am the innocent cause of our sorrows, and told him of the exchange of the lamp. Hmm. Now I know, cried the Aladdin, that we have to thank the African magician for this. Where's the lamp? He carries it about with him, said the princess. I know, for he pulled it out of his breast to show me. He wishes me to break my faith with you uh, and marry him, saying that you were beheaded by my father's command. He's forever speaking ill of you, but I only reply by my tears. If I persist, I doubt not that he will use violence against me. Aladdin comforted her and left her for a while. He changed clothes with the first person he met in the town and, having bought a certain powder, returned to the princess who led him in by a little side door. <clears throat> Put on your most beautiful dress, he said to her, and received the magician with smiles, leading him to believe that you've forgotten me. Invite him to sup with you and say you wish to taste the wine of his country. He will go for some, and while he's gone, I'll tell you what to do. She listened carefully to Aladdin, and when he left her, arrayed herself gaily for the first time since she left China. She put on a girdle and a headdress of diamonds, and seeing in the glass that she looked more beautiful than ever, received the magician, saying to his great amazement, I've made up my mind that Aladdin is dead, and that all my tears will not bring him back to me, so I'm resolved to mourn no more. And I've therefore invited you to sup with me, but I'm tired of the wines of China and would fain taste those of Africa. The magician flew to his cellar, <laughs> and the princess put the powder Aladdin had given her in her cup. When he returned, she asked him to drink her health in the wine of Africa, handing him her cup in exchange for his as a sign she was reconciled to him. Before drinking, the magician made her a speech in praise of her beauty. But the princess cut him short, saying, Let me drink first, and you shall say what you will afterwards. She set her cups to her lips and kept it there, while the magician drained his to the dregs and fell backwards, dead. The princess then opened the door to Aladdin and flung her arms around his neck, but Aladdin put her away, bidding her to leave him as she had more to do. He then went to the dead magician, took the lamp out of his vest, and bade the genie carry the palace and all in it back to China. This was done, and the princess in her chamber only felt two little shocks 
and little thought she was at home again. The Sultan, who was sitting in his closet, mourning for his lost daughter, happened to look up and rubbed his eyes. For there stood the palace as before. He hastened thither, and Aladdin received him in the hall of four and twenty windows, with the princess at his side. Aladdin told him what had happened, and showed him the body of the magician that he might believe. A ten days feast was proclaimed, and it seemed as if Aladdin might now live the rest of his life in peace. But it was not to be. The African magician had a younger brother, who was, if possible, more wicked and more cunning than himself. He traveled to China to avenge his brother's death and went to visit a pious woman called Fatima, thinking she might be of use to him. He entered her cell and clapped a dagger to her breast, telling her to rise and do his bidding on pain of death. He changed clothes with her, colored his face like hers, and put on her veil. Then he went towards the palace of Aladdin, and all the people thinking he was the holy woman gathered round him, kissing his hands and begging his blessing. When he got to the palace, there was such a noise going on around him that the princess bade her servant to look out the window and ask what was the matter. The servant said it was the holy woman, curing people by her touch of their ailments. Whereupon the princess, who had long desired to see Fatima, sent for her. On coming to the princess, the magician offered up a prayer for her health and prosperity. When he had done, the princess made him sit by her and begged him to stay with her always. Hmm. The false Fatima, who wished for nothing better, consented, but kept his veil down for fear of discovery. The princess showed him the hall and asked him what she thought of it. <clears throat> It is truly beautiful, said the false Fatima. In my mind, it wants but one thing. And what is that? asked the princess. If only a rock's egg, replied he, were hung up from the middle of the dome, it would be the wonder of the world. After this, well, the princess could think of nothing but a rock's egg. And when Aladdin returned from hunting, he found her in a very ill humor. He begged to know what was amiss, and she told him that all her pleasure in the hall was spoilt for the want of a rock's egg hanging down from the dome. <laughs> if that's all, replied Aladdin, you shall soon be happy. He left her and rubbed the lamp, and when the genie appeared, commanded him to bring a rock's egg. The genie gave such a loud and terrible shriek that the hall shook. <laughs> Wretch, he cried, is it not enough that I've done everything for you, but you must command me to bring my master and hang him up in the midst of this dome? You and your wife and your palace deserve to be burnt to ashes. But this request does not come from you, but from the brother of the African magician whom you destroyed. He's now in your palace disguised as the holy woman whom he killed. It was he who put that wish into your wife's head. Take care of yourself, for he means to kill you. So saying, the genie disappeared. Aladdin went back to the princess, saying his head ached and requesting that the holy Fatima should be fetched to lay her hands on it. But when the magician came near, Aladdin, seizing his dagger, pierced him to the heart. What have you done? cried the princess. You've killed the holy woman. Hmm, not so, replied Aladdin, but a wicked magician, and told her of how she'd been deceived. And after this, Aladdin and his wife lived in peace. He succeeded the sultan when he died, and reigned for many years, leaving behind him a long line of kings. And that's the end of our wonderful story, Aladdin and the Magical Lamp. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed it. And until next time, happy story time.